Welcome back, my name is Arya and I don't waste your time, so let's get straight into it. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's video, we're doing a bit of a different video. We're doing a more relaxed, laid back style of video. We're gonna be talking about all the different holdings in my portfolio, giving an update for the month of June, what I'm thinking through with every single one of the holdings, whether I'm thinking of adding more to the position, so on and so forth. So as our friends over on Twitter would know, I do somewhat like a weekly, maybe roughly every 10 days or so, I do a uh, portfolio update going through all the different holdings, whether I bought stuff, whether I sold stuff, what I'm thinking through, just essentially this, but in text format, not video format. And uh, you could go over and I, I go in very thorough detail over there, so you should follow me on Twitter. But long story short, I do post very frequently of what the portfolio looks like. So for starters, I do have massive concentration into like basically three companies, more so two companies. That is, of course, Amazon, which I've raved about over and over again, both on Twitter and here on YouTube. I've made multiple, multiple videos talking about why I think it's probably going to be the biggest company in the world. You could go ahead and check out the stock analysis that I've done on that business. But long story short, we have massive secular tailwinds across all the different business lines. Secular tailwinds, that means massive growth prospects for their uh, various revenue lines. You got cloud computing, which we are seeing a massive transformation from on-premise IT infrastructure over to cloud IT infrastructure, roughly a 1585 split. Experts are saying that that's going to flip in the future. We're looking at 8515. But anyways, that's besides the point. So we got that massive secular tailwind. In addition, you got e-commerce and online purchases of goods. That is another secular tailwind that they're benefiting from. And of course, they've kind of spun up this advertising business that's bigger than Netflix and it's bigger than YouTube out of nowhere over the past like four or five years. So there's that, uh, of course, as well, right? Digital advertising, again, a massive, massive market growing incredibly fast, right? So when I look at Amazon, I see like a, almost like an ETF of like very good businesses with massive secular tailwinds. That's the thesis with Amazon. That's why I was buying it. And again, I've tweeted about this extensively. I was buying that one in February um, post the quarter that, that they had blow, the blowout quarter with loss of free cash flow. I, I was buying Amazon heavily, right? And I was buying between the $160 to $175 timeframe. And it is currently at $200. Now I'm, I'm no magician, but based off my valuation work, I was looking at the amount of free cash flow they generated, their amount of free cash flow they're expected to generate. And we can go over this in the spreadsheet later on in the video, but that's why I was buying the business back then. So far it's worked out well because the stock price is at 200. Moving on, you could see that I have a 31% position in Salesforce. And Salesforce is somewhat of a very controversial holding of mine. For starters, most people don't understand what Salesforce is, and that's totally fair. It's not like the Costco or McDonald's of the world where it's very obvious what their business model is. You, odds are you're a customer of that business. With Salesforce, it's uh, B2B enterprise software. It's a customer relationship management software. What does that really mean? What's the use case for it? Why is it even important? Why is it relevant? Why is it powerful? Right, like very fair questions to be asking when you're faced with trying to research this business that is Salesforce. Now, I've talked extensively both on YouTube, I've done three videos on Salesforce, and I've probably done like over 30, 40 different tweets talking about Salesforce in increments. The number one thing that I'm gonna recommend, just as a beginner thing, I've given an analogy. These are Discord messages that I've put into screenshots. It's a tweet, it'll be linked in the description, but I'll give you the explanation here as well. This is like by far the best analogy I've possibly been able to give. I've compared Salesforce to Apple. And if you think that's not a fair comparison, it's absolutely a fair comparison because Mark Benioff, the founder of Salesforce, actually gifted the App Store name to Steve Jobs himself, right? So there's quite a little bit of comparisons, especially strategy-wise between these two businesses. Now, the comparison that I made, I said, odds are you watching this right now, it's probably on an Apple phone, and, or like an Apple device in general. And odds are that maybe a decade ago or something like that, you bought an Apple device. And since then you haven't switched off of that Apple device. You're, you're used to the software of the phone. You are used to the iTunes having it on. You're used to all the different services that they've uh, brought in. You ran out of storage. So you started storing your photos on iCloud. And so you're ingrained into the Apple ecosystem in a multitude of ways. You initially started out with the phone but then now you got all these different services you're paying for. And then on top of that, after a little while, you're like, you know what? I need headphones. Why go with like Sony, which is like a random brand. Okay, whatever. But you know what? Apple has these new AirPods that just came out and you know, I'll, I'll give them a try. It's only 200 bucks, whatever. And you know, I don't want the big bulky, you know, headphones and whatnot, right? So you get the AirPods after a little bit. And then afterwards you're in the market for your new laptop. 
odds are you go with the MacBook. And then after a little bit, you're like, you know what, for my job, I actually need to uh, collect signatures and whatnot. They asked me to get a uh, tablet on their expense. And so odds are you decide, okay, you know what, Apple Pencil, the iPad is professional, syncs up with everything, AirDrop in between. It works well. You know what, let me go with the iPad. And after a little bit, you're like, you know what, I'm going to treat myself. My new stimulus check came in from the government. Let me get a smartwatch because I absolutely need that. Odds are you buy an Apple smartwatch, right? And, and the exact same principle applies to Salesforce. Salesforce might start out as the core CRM offering where when you, for example, go into uh, Amazon and you sign up for Amazon, they might store your postal address. They might uh, store your address, your name, your last name, phone number, the credit card you're using. Uh, all, all these different facts about you, the customer, they'll store that, that'll be on Salesforce, right? But then over time, Amazon sitting there, like, you know what, just having our customer data on Salesforce, sure, cool, whatever, but we need to maybe try to add, oh, you know what, marketing and commerce, let's include marketing and commerce uh, cloud, which is a product that Salesforce offers. And from now on, every time one of our customers actually shops at Amazon, let's send them a confirmation email saying, this is your confirmation order. This is what you ordered. That's the total. And thank you for shopping at Amazon. Every single time I shop at Amazon, I get an email within like 30 seconds confirming with me. That's using Salesforce, right? And a little bit further into that, if you notice, um, Amazon, if you go on the Amazon website and you're scrolling down, let's just say you're getting like an office mouse, right? It says frequently purchased with, and it'll put like a keyboard, it'll put, I don't know, a couple other items, like a webcam, whatever the case is. And that is data analytics. Now, data analytics is a very competitive industry and there's lots of players for that. I think even FICO, right? Like the, the credit rating company, like they also do data analytics, right? So not necessarily that it's Salesforce, but just to give you an idea, let's just say they've, they're using the CRM software, they're using the marketing stuff. And then after a little bit, uh, Salesforce is like, hey, we have a lot of data here, uh, completely your data, Amazon, but we could offer you analytics on this data to be able to sell maybe 5% better. If Salesforce comes to Amazon saying, hey, we noticed that these three items are frequently purchased with each other. Is that valuable information to you? They give that to Amazon and Amazon lists it at the bottom there. Even if the sales of those three items is increased by 5%, that is absolutely worth the investment of paying for analytics from Salesforce. So this is the cross-selling ability that the ecosystem moat of these big software companies has. Microsoft has ran this playbook for no joke, 40 goddamn years, right? So we are seeing older brother Microsoft be absolutely successful with this strategy of cross-selling software and cross-selling different services. So you might start out with basic customer service and basic sales cloud offerings of Salesforce, but then over time you start to trickle in other items. And then by then the switching costs of going to a different vendor is incredibly high. You could imagine on a personal level, if you have the iPhone, you have the watch, you have the services, you have literally everything on Apple, the odds of you switching to like a Samsung for your next phone is nearly zero. You're not going to go through the headache of learning any of that new information. And more importantly, you're not going to go through the headache of actually transferring all your data, all your photos, all the songs, all the apps, you're not gonna go through the headache of transferring that to a Samsung. The exact same thing applies to Salesforce. Once you're using like even one of the different clouds, let alone like four or five, you're not ever switching off, right? So this is the example that I've given with Salesforce. I think it's a very appropriate example to analyze uh, Salesforce. It, it does have the ecosystem mode and they also do have the app store. So it'll link up with like DocuSign for document signing, or it'll link up with various different softwares from other companies on the Salesforce app store. And they take like 15% as well, right? Just absolute like a bully <laughs> in the industry, right? So that's why I've, I've gone very heavy into Salesforce. I bought it at $216, a per, uh, at $216 per share. I think I added about 10% to the position, right? So it went from a 20% position to a 30% position. And the shares that I bought in that big purchase, those were shares at the 216 price level roughly. I think I added one more time at 237, I'd have to double check. My current cost basis on this, by the way, is sitting at 257 per share. So anyways, I think I've raved enough about Salesforce. Long story short, cross-selling software, high switching costs, ecosystem moat, incredible company. And it's mission critical to the existence of most of these businesses, right? Incredible company. I, I cannot like recommend researching that company more. Moving on, Google. Um, I'm gonna keep this one simple. It's the best product ever. I'm going to link a podcast in the description that is 
I've, I've re-listened to it multiple, multiple times. It's from a guy who has 100% of his portfolio in Google, and he's incredibly bullish on the company. I think roughly 70% of revenues comes from search. And uh, of course, search is split up into like banner ads and like the four links at the top whenever you search whatever. Um, so it, it is a mix of various different types of ads, but nonetheless, like that is search revenue and uh, ad revenue specifically from uh, the most important the most important segment in Google. And I'm incredibly bullish on that. I mean, sure, like search in the internet is like decently mature as it stands currently, but I think more importantly is online advertising going to be more dominant and more important in the next 10 years. I think that that's like, if you're investing in Google, you gotta answer that question. Is 10 years from now, online advertising going to be more prevalent than it is today? I think the answer to that is yes. Odds are that advertising over time is going to switch more into digital forms and uh, YouTube and search and all that type of stuff. And I think most people don't understand that when Google is listing all these different ads, it's essentially a bidding war, right? Like to be at the top of these search terms, it's a bidding war. You could go to this website, which I, I forget the name of, the, perplex, the Perplexity CEO was actually talking about it, but you could go and essentially bid to be at the top of various different search terms in your niche. And over time, I think uh, this bidding war between these various businesses that essentially have money to burn with their marketing budgets, like imagine like Nike or something, right? The, when, when you search up sport shoe or whatever, like they really want to be at the top there because it, it literally makes a difference of being right at the top when you search up some shoe or being like four listings down. Like people aren't, like some people aren't probably going to uh, scroll, like some people probably aren't going to scroll a couple listings down and click on your link specifically, right? To each their own. But my point is that Nike and all these different, like all these Fortune 1000 brands, they're going to want to continue spending lots and lots of money on digital platforms because they're seeing a very high return on their marketing investment. And Google is a pure play on that. And then additionally, like GCP is just now becoming profitable. So that'll be interesting. I'm not particularly bullish on that, but nonetheless, like the move to cloud, like GCP should be able to pick up some of the scraps uh, below Amazon and Microsoft. And then moreover, YouTube. I mean, YouTube is just, a, uh, we're on YouTube right now. YouTube is a absolutely incredible asset. It's probably one of the best acquisitions of all time. One important thing to note with Google, I mean, um, one important thing to note with YouTube specifically is as the number of YouTube premium memberships increases over time, so more and more people are paying to not have ads, the pool of ads doesn't change. There's still, let's just do easy numbers. There's still like, for example, 100 ads. And let's just say five years ago, those 100 ads would be shown to 100 people. But over time, let's just say 20 of those people have uh, got the YouTube premium membership and now they, they're seeing no ads. So this 100 ads is now shown to a smaller pool of people, which makes the user experience just a little bit worse and incentivizes the 80 people that aren't on YouTube premium, incentivizes them to get on YouTube premium because now they're sitting through like 30 second ads, right? Like I'm sure as if you guys have been using YouTube for a long period of time, it used to be like just one ad after five seconds, you could skip. And then it became two ads. After five seconds, you could skip both ads. And then it became two ads. You can't skip both of them. And then it became two ads. One of them is 15 seconds. You can't skip. The other one you could skip after five seconds, right? So progressively, they're like walking you up the ladder of showing you these ads, but not letting you skip, <laughs> right? So the reason why and this is so messed up, but from a shareholder perspective, I'm very happy. But the reason why I'm incredibly bullish on YouTube is because of the subscription. It's gonna continuously make the user, the free user experience worse and worse. So that should translate to higher and higher revenues. One, because the advertisers are now bidding on a smaller pool of possible viewers. And, and two, the subscription is gonna continuously grow and grow. And that's like an add-on that is just pure margin, right? So YouTube, incredible asset, one of a kind asset. It's user generated. So, I mean, YouTube themselves, they don't have to really put that much money in like they don't have to invest that much in order to churn out all this money like people like i'm making youtube videos for free right now right so it's it's an incredible asset i'm incredibly bullish on that side of the business and then in the other bet segment i think waymo could possibly be profitable like super long term i don't know just, that that's that's like a call option on the stock for me moving on because i think we're yapping a little bit too much here paycom paycom's a weird one for me i've done two videos now talking about it so i I'd recommend you guys go watch that for my full thoughts long story short i just think it's like short-term oversold and this is a, a software business at the end of the day 
Like we have reoccurring revenues from this business. And over time, I think the market should reward the roughly mid teens growth. I'm probably not going to add to this one just purely from a, this is not a mega moat company. This is not like a world renowned software business. It's a, it's a $10 billion HCM provider, right? Like these things could explode and I'm willing to put like six, 7% of the portfolio into it. I'm happy with that, but I don't think I'll be adding to it in the future. ASML. I would love to add the ASML. Um, I'll be honest with you guys. I, ASML, if you didn't know, is a like just total monopoly on EUV machines. These are the machines that go into TSMC factories to make like literally the chips in a any advanced technology around the world. Everything from uh, this iPhone over here that I'm recording on, everything to the uh, computer chips in my computer right now that is got this whole setup going on over here, right? All the different advanced chips that are used around the world come from TSMC factories using ASML lithography machines. It's a robust business with like roughly 20% EPS and free cash flow growth on a going forward basis. The problem with that is I bought this at 587 a share. It is currently at like 1,070. So the stock prices ran a little bit and I'm not scared of adding at higher prices. Absolutely not. The other problem I have is the valuation has nearly doubled since I bought. When I bought, it was trading at a 26 forward PE. Currently, it's at a 55 trailing PE. So a little bit of difference there between forward and trailing, but nonetheless, like the valuation has ran. Yeah, I think forward PE is probably in the 40-ish range at the moment. So just to give you an idea, like it's a multiple expansion story with some growth, and that's why I'm hesitant. If I were to add to this business, it would probably have to be like around the $800 range, give or take. That lands it at just shy of like, I think 38 PE or so. And the reason why I'm valuing this on PE, not uh, free cash flow, it's a very inventory heavy business. So cash flows are just weird all the time. You'll have a couple of years of just like, uh, cash flows are weird, right? Like when you are essentially an assembly company and your inventories could spike up and down out of control all the time, um, cash flow isn't the best representation of pure profitability. That's why I'm using net income and uh, PE ratio and all that type of stuff, right? So yeah, again, like probably sub 40 PE, which like I'll maybe add to it just purely from like, a, I wanna get in on this beautiful company. Evolution Gaming. Very small holding. I unfortunately have to let go of this one over the coming uh, probably month or so. So I have two brokerages that my portfolio is split in between. And I want to move the old uh, brokerage onto the new broker. Like my all, all the holdings that I have, I want to move it to uh, the new brokerage because it's cheaper fees and whatnot, right? And the problem I'm having with that is the new brokerage that I have does not allow international ADRs, uh, which is what Evolution Gaming is, right? So the problem I'm running with that is I don't really want to sell a business at depressed prices when I think it's like incredibly undervalued, but at the same time, I have to sell uh, in order to move my brokerage. So unfortunately, I'm probably just going to let it go. It's a small holding anyways, but I'm still incredibly bullish on the company. Unfortunately, I'll just be watching it from the sidelines from now on. Morgan Stanley Capital International, another very unsafe holding in my portfolio. I've gone into detail on Twitter about why I'll be selling out of this one, but long story short, like revenues are growing at about 10%. And I feel like I just kind of like FOMO bought into it at like 460 just because it dropped down in price a lot. And I'm like, oh, this is just short term overshow, whatever. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's just a small holding. I'm not willing to add to it and whatnot. I think honestly, like if I want to go like the, the financial infrastructure type companies, I think MasterCard is a better shout. So I'm honestly thinking of I have to sell Evolution and I have to sell MSCI. I don't have to sell MSCI. I want to sell MSCI. So that lands at like 7% of the portfolio. I'm thinking of just outright putting that into MasterCard because um, I'm growing very interested in MasterCard. And you know what? In fact, while we're at it, we could jump over to the uh, free cash flow growth spreadsheet. Long story short, guys, I talk about this in every video. Essentially, what we're doing here is we're taking the current valuation of the business and we're dividing it by how fast we expect the company to grow at. And so if you were to take a look here, you can see that MSCI is roughly at a 2.2 times multiple that lands at a about fair value, just above fair value in my opinion. And the thing is that I could just buy into MasterCard and honestly, let's just even drop the growth rate on this a little bit more. Let's say it grows at like 15.5%, which is like decently conservative. I think MasterCard is gonna grow revenues at like 12%, add on like a two, two and a half percent buyback, you're at like 14 and a half, 15% and then add the yield on, right? A little bit of margin expansion, you're looking at like 15 to 16% free cash flow growth, right? Like. Um, I, I don't think that is particularly bullish for MasterCard, right? And you can see that it's it's slightly cheaper than MSCI and it's growing a little bit faster. And honestly, it's a business that I understand a little bit better. And a 
issue that I have with MSCI is that most of the growth in that business right now is coming from the ESG segment. And the ESG segment is not a business line that I understand particularly well. And more importantly, I don't think it has like multi-decade long growth trends behind it like MasterCard does. MasterCard is payments. Payments have a very sustainable, very durable, long runway of growth out of them. ESG is like a very new kind of uncertain thing that MSCI has spun up. Sure, they have massive market share, but I don't know if it'll stick a decade from now, right? Like it might just be the next um, fad, right? They're, they're trying to create a language protocol moat, uh, of course, jealous of uh, S&P Global with their credit ratings. But yeah, like most of the growth is coming from ESG. So that kind of warrants a little bit more risk for me that I'm probably not willing to hold through. But anyways, this mostly wraps up the portfolio portfolio review. Long story short, I think I have to sell out of Evolution. I also probably will be selling out of MSCI. I'm going to reallocate most probably to MasterCard. I am liking what I see out of Uber. But again, the problem with Uber I have, it's just like an uncertain new industry. And I think the problem I'm having with that is the thesis is too simple for me. Like they're, they just hit scale and they become profitable and they produce rampant free cash flow. Like, it, that seems too simple for me. There needs to be something a little bit more there. So some more challenges. I, I don't know. I, I got to research that one a little bit more. You should check out the video, by the way, that I made on that one. But yeah, that about wraps up the portfolio update. That's what we did. Those are pretty much my plans. That is the commentary that I have for every single one of my holdings. And if you like the fact that I don't waste your time and provide high quality content to you, go ahead and hit the subscribe button because I'm going to continue to post videos just like this one. And you can always go back on that decision if you end up not liking the videos, but I highly doubt that. Thank you for watching and have a great day.